Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming uh, to this uh, new uh, edition of our um, community seminars. Uh, today, uh, I'm very happy to uh, have uh, to be able to introduce uh, Dani Reta, uh, who is uh, today's speaker. Uh, Dani uh, did his uh, PhD in theoretical chemistry in the University of uh, Barcelona and then decided to uh, walk the, the, the path less traveled by jumping into uh, doing experimental work uh, in, a, in a very uh, successful uh, postdoc in the University of Manchester uh, under the supervision of uh, Nicholas Chilton. And uh, after his time in Manchester, uh, he uh, came back to Spain first for a brief period in, in Barcelona, and then uh, here at the University of the Basque Country and at the IPC uh, as an as an Iker Basque fellow. Um, even if uh, Dani is very young, he uh, already has received a number of uh, fellowships and awards like the Royal Society of Chemistry uh, Horizon uh, Prize and uh, the Iker Basque Fellowship we have mentioned and, uh, and uh, Beatriz de, de Pinos. Uh, fellowship. Um, so uh, with this, um, I will, uh, yeah, you can uh, carry on with your talk. Just before that, uh, please remember that there will be uh, a few, well, drinks and nibbles uh, served after the talk uh, in case you want to speak with Danny a little uh, more about his research. So without any further ado, Danny, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. First of all, I didn't get the RSC Horizon myself. It, it was an award for uh, belonging to the group of uh, Manchester. It wasn't personally granted to me. Uh, but yes, thank you for, for that introduction and thank you all for coming. It's a, it's a great being here. It's actually the first time I'll speak in front of the DIPC community. I only joined the University of the Basque Country a year, a bit more than a year ago. And hopefully this talk will contribute to uh, highlighting possible overlapping uh, experiences between the, the members of the community and hopefully even some uh, discussions and uh, ways to collaborate. Maybe. So basically my work revolves around the concept of uh, molecular magnetism. Uh, and since my talk is gonna be well, 45 minutes and then I'll be talking about different things, I thought it would be appropriate to have some sort of outline to keep track of where I am and where I'm going to be going. And just so you know, I'm going to spend around, around 10 minutes in each of the sex, uh, sections. So if you are bored in one of them, just snooze and wait for the next 10 minutes to be, to be better. Uh, so first, a brief, of, a brief uh, motivation on why do we bother to study my single what, molecular magnetism as a general concept. And I think uh, one of the fields of research that better exemplify the potential of using a molecular of molecules that are magnetic is the field of uh, quantum information. And here I'm there are, in the literature, there are loads of examples that are very exciting and uh, explain very well how it, these molecules can be used for different purposes. But I've chosen a couple of them because they exemplify concepts that are going to be relevant for the world that I'll be presenting later. And in this case, this is a molecule that has been used, believe it or not, to implement, as a QDIT, to implement the Grover algorithm when it's sitting between a, a transistor. And the thing is that first thing to notice here is that you have this uh, center, center metal atom here, which in this case is terbium 3 plus. And the key mm -hmm. is to realize that depending on what kind of molecular environment you put uh, surrounding a metal atom, you can affect the energy separation between electronic states and the decomposition. And in this case, this particular environment, what does is it uh, results in a very well isolated spin doublet from the higher excited states. So if you are performing your measurements and you are using this qubit uh, at low temperature, you are sure that whatever you're doing it's happening here. You don't have contributions from anything up there. And then um, if you introduce a further uh, concept in your, in your molecule, which is that of a nuclear spin, in this case is exemplified or achieved through working with an isotope 
uh, of, of terbium, which has a nuclear spin of three halves. Uh, there is a hyperfine interaction between the spin and the nuclear spin, uh, the electronic spin and the nuclear spin. And what was a perfectly degenerate doublet splits in four because you have a, spin, a nuclear spin of three halves. So, uh, that. And then what is key to notice is that you can access each of these transitions at different uh, values of external magnetic field. And the next uh, thing that they did is to use this to, uh, when they generated this uh, single molecule transistor, to characterize the relaxation times of each of these different uh, crossings or EPR transitions, if you want to call them like that, uh, characterize them independently and use them to implement the, the, the Gober uh, algorithm. I'm not going to explain how they did it because I wouldn't do a good job, but I highly recommend these papers. Another example of uh, the potential of, of uh, molecular magnetism in, in the field of quantum information is very nicely exemplified this other, by this other molecule here. Now, instead of a terbium, a terbium three plus, we have a lutetium two plus. And here the concept or, or the, the idea is trying to solve something that plagues the implementation or of a, a problem that exists throughout the uh, different implementations of uh, quantum information technologies using different platforms, which is having or extending the quantum coherences so you can perform your operations uh, or the relaxation times of your system are long enough so you can implement the operations that you want. And you can, impl you can uh, improve this in single molecule magnets by a clever trick, which is working at the clock transitions, which are just these positions of external magnetic field where the change of the energy of the states that you are probing as a qubit uh, with respect to the field are zero because that's the magnetization. So even though you have a magnetic system and there are an external magnetic field, somehow your molecule has zero magnetization, behaves effectively as a diamagnet, and therefore doesn't see the other dipolar fields that induce the coherence. And then you have improved quantum coherence. Another field where another field where uh, molecular magnetism has been proven to be a uh, relevant is that of organic light emitting uh, diodes. So in a conventional fluorescence picture, you promote from the singlet state, you have the hole in the particle, they recombine and spin the statistics tells you that only 25% of uh, the, there's gonna be a 25% population transferred to the emissive states, which are the singlet ones. And then the triplet ones are gonna be populated ma mainly and they are gonna decay through non radiative uh, pathways. So you lose the, the light that you put in doesn't come as the light that you put out, and that's limiting your quantum efficiency. One way of solving this, which doesn't necessarily have to do with uh, molecular magnetism, is uh, it's making the triplet states participate. And how you do how do you do that through uh, tweaking the energy separation between the singlet and triplet states and uh, promoting the interaction between them through a uh, spin orbit coupling. And that's what coined the concept of thermally activated delay fluorescence, which uh, allows for uh, uh, an improvement of the quantum efficiency. And then recently they proposed this delayed, delayed, yeah, delayed fluorescence inverse single triplet, which by clever engineering of your molecule, you just bypass Hun's rule and you have the triplet state above the, the singlet state. And therefore, when you, you decay, you have more chances of decaying to the radiative path and to the radiative states. But where molecular magnetism comes in uh, handy in this case is by just bypassing spin statistics uh, altogether and using a molecule that is a spin uh, one half. It's a, a radical, and then you have transitions between states that are of the same spin character, and then you don't have any kind of limitation from the spin statistics. And last but not least, uh, an example of how molecular magnetism can be, can be used very cleverly in the field of uh, synthetic chemistry, uh, exemplified by this, uh, by this example here, which is a radi radical mediated uh, 
or radical intermediary in the reaction path that allows for uh, molecules or for forming new CH bond, bonds in molecules uh, that has a huge scope. Uh, for instance, here the, the, mole the, the research the authors present an example of all the different molecules that they can access, and then they compare uh, with current established methodologies in the pharmaceutical industry, for instance, uh, of how they achieved this, this, the same molecule and compare with the industry, and they basically find that they do it better and they do it cheaper and more efficient. So hopefully I've given you some sort of overview of why bother with molecular magnetic uh, molecules that are magnetic because they basically let you do many, many things. So now I just outline briefly uh, both the experimental and computational aspects that are common to, to the work that I will present later. And hopefully I'll uh, zoom in a bit more, be more specific about the work that I do. So first, the point of entry uh, in magnetic characterization of any system is really a direct current magnetometry, which is you apply an external magnetic field and you measure the moment of your sun. That's normally done, for instance, with a squid, which is a very sensitive uh, superconductor. So this uh, fellow here I have already introduced before, which is the magnetization, is the derivative of the field, uh, the energy with respect to the field. In general, this energy will have an expression that involves, uh, sorry about that, that involves uh, different states and you will have to bother with the partition function and whatnot. But in some specific circumstances, for instance, if you are at very low temperatures and you have spin-only systems, there are some simplifications that one can make and gain very useful information about your system by simply looking, for instance, at the saturation value of the magnetization curves that would allow you, depending on these actual values, uh, that, can that will tell you whether you have a spin half or three halves or whatever. But uh, magnetization also informs about the dynamic properties of your, simple, uh, of your system. And here I'm exemplifying three limiting cases. Uh, this line here would be a case in which your molecule doesn't retain any magnetization at all. You don't have any magnetic hysteresis. <clears throat> then this other example here is your sample retains magnetization until it uh, appro uh, approaches zero field, and suddenly there is a big drop in magnetization, and that's normally referred to quantum tunneling of magnetization, which is a fascinating effect because it's a purely quantum uh, phenomenon on a macroscopic sample. And then you have a perfectly open magnetic hysteresis, which would represent a perfectly destable uh, system. And that's one of the reasons why single molecule magnets that I will be talking about later are uh, normally referred to as um, candidates for information storage, because they can be thought uh, of as having very definite, or uh, yeah, very separate values of magnetization at the same magnetic uh, fields. But then you also have uh, the, the susceptibility, which is the second derivative of the energy with respect to the field. And that's also very handy because it can tell you, for instance, whether your sample is just a normal paramagnet or you have some sort of ordering in your sample, whether it's ferromagnetic, uh, parameterized with the Curie temperature or anti-ferromagnetic with the nil temperature. Uh, susceptibility also can tell you a lot about your the dynamic properties of your system. Um, for instance, if you do the zero field, cool field, cool traces of the susceptibility, the point in which the zero field cool peaks is where you have a blocking of, well, well where your molecule or your system stops blocking uh, the magnetization, basically. And then there is also, like in this case, a clever simplification that you can make. Uh, if you look at the chi T values, so susceptibility times temperature at high temperatures in your system, uh, it, depending on the values that you obtain here, you can very easily have an idea of what kind of systems you have. Of, uh, it gives you information of the electronic structure of the of complex uh, systems that you might have. So that was DC, and now you can do alternate current magnetometry. Instead of applying an external magnetic field, uh, you apply an oscillating one. And of course, you can do that in zero external field or in field or and changing temperature. And the key is that this allows you to change the frequency, the AC frequency. So imagine you have a molecule or a system that can retain or has some sort of uh, magnetization retention or, it is, or 
said in other words, it relaxes slowly. If you uh, subject that to, to an oscillating field, uh, it will try to catch up with the oscillating field and it will introduce an imaginary component. That is the treatment here is completely analogous to the Debye treatment for the electrics, if that says something to anyone. And basically what you're doing is at low frequencies, you are switching the field so slow that by the time you measure, your molecule has relaxed and you are measuring the thermal, uh, sorry, the isothermal uh, component of the susceptibility. On the other hand, if you are switching it very quickly, you don't give time for the system to relax and you are measuring the adiabatic component and somewhere in the middle, the, co the complex value susceptibility peaks and that gives you uh, the relaxation time, the characteristic time, which is basically how long it takes for your system to relax, to go from non-equilibrium to equilibrium. Then if you do that at different temperatures, you end up with this, uh, am I not uh, you end up with this relaxation profile that is, uh, keep this in mind because it's gonna become very important later. And then of course you have EPR, which I just briefly say that it's a very sensitive technique that gives you access directly to very subtle microscopic parameters that you might have in your, that parameterize your electronic structure. Here for instance, could be the, the singlet, triplet energy gap or the zero field splitting term here. But basically what I wanted to highlight is that it gives you something that none of these techniques can give you, which is a structural information based on uh, accessing the, the hyperfine coupling, as I, as I showed you in the first examples, because this A value, so this, the splitting between the peaks is characteristic of where the unpaired electron is. There are some parameterized uh, values and that can give you an idea whether it's in a surrounding or not. Basically, I've told you all this just because it kind of highlights or uh, sets up the protocol of what we normally do, which is we, sum, we uh, characterize our samples with this uh, combination of methods. And then we propose a physically meaningful spin, a model spin Hamiltonian, which is used to fit globally, hopefully uh, in the best case. Uh, and that allows you to, to validate the, the model. And then the initial guess values for those fittings are normally obtained with ab initio methods. They will talk about now. And then uh, two very, established programs that are normally used to do this kind of thing are PHI or uh, easy spin. Right, so that was the experimental characterization. Now, how do we go about to get uh, this uh, different microscopic uh, parameter that we use to plug in in the model spin Hamiltonian? First, we <coughs> normally work with, uh, in close contact with, uh, with experimentalists. So that's the first problem solved because they normally give us the crystal structure of, our, of the molecule they want us to study. And then we need to optimize this uh, geometry and we normally do it with EFT. There's nothing fancy here. Then we need to describe the electronic structure. And here we need to uh, differentiate whether we have a spin-only system or a spin-orbit coupled system because there is they are completely different problems and therefore you need different methodologies to describe them properly. But basically, uh, for spin-only systems, if you have an, a method that is able to describe the energy difference between the spin-adapted states, that will give you energy differences that can be parameterized uh, with, uh, with different uh, parameters. Of your of your chosen model uh, spin Hamiltonian, namely I don't know exchange interaction, or if you are considering a Hubbard a Hubbard Hamiltonian T and U, you name it. Uh, but sometimes you just can't do a CASIEV or CASPT2 calculation to get those spin adapted solutions, and then you need to resort uh, to to DFT uh, and, and single determinant configurations. Um, and then that's where, it, where the concept of a mapping approach uh, comes in, because imagine you have this, your exact solution in uh, non-relativistic and time independent, you cannot calculate this at all, but you can, uh, in principle, you can calculate this uh, spin adapted solutions, which would be these ones here, and express them as a simple linear combination of your, of your unknowns. <clears throat> But 
depending on your system, you might run into a situation in which you have maybe three unknowns, but only two energy differences. And therefore, you, it's an un, uh, underdetermined uh, system and you cannot solve it. And that's where you can use uh, a simplified expression of the high seven Hamiltonian, which maps directly to the TFT calculations that you are uh, converging to. And then you can express these new energy differences with DFT in terms of the same parameters uh, that you, you would use in, in a spain adapted solution. And that's just to say that you can get the same kind of picture uh, and information with a cheaper method. And that's called mapping approach. And it's also uh, uh, an important concept. Now, if you want to study spin orbit coupled systems, you have a complete different set of problems you need to include relativistic uh, corrections. And we normally do it, what we do, we will always do it, uh, with the uh, scalar relativistic corrections uh, through the DKH Hamiltonian and using uh, fit for purpose uh, basis. And then the spin orbit coupling, we take it into account by uh, converging the different spin states, uh, spin free states, and then mix them, mixing them together through state interaction, which basically allows you to calculate uh, matrix elements uh, incorporating uh, incorporating the spin orbit coupling from the onset. And then once you've done all these expensive calculations, you can parameterize them with what is known as a crystal field Hamiltonian, which is a much cheaper way and much uh, uh, easier way to basically get the same kind of information. And we use it as a phenomenological approach here. We don't assign any kind of specific values, uh, uh, specific um, meaning to the different uh, crystal field parameters. Ah, and then we have the geometry, we have the electronic structure. Now we need to describe the spin dynamics and uh, for relaxing systems. And for that, we use the, we need to calculate the spin phonon coupling. I'll give more details about this later on, so I'm not gonna spend much time here. And then once you've done that, you need to uh, let your system evolve from out of equilibrium to equilibrium and, and try to calculate how long it takes. And then once you've, once you've done this, you can directly calculate those values with the relaxation profiles, experimental ones that I showed you before and assess whether you're doing a good job or not. So now I'll move on to specific work that I've been doing, uh, considering first the first class of uh, molecules that I'll be talking about, which are single molecule magnets. And basically, if you, the, the most uh, relaxed definition you can think of for a single molecule magnet is a system that has, that shows a slow relaxation of magnetization down to the molecular origin. It doesn't have to do with interaction between molecules. It just, if you were able to take one of the molecules and measure it, the properties would be the exact same as if you were measuring a crystal. Um, and in order to get that, you need magnetic anisotropy, which is achieved through spin orbit coupling. And let me give you an example how you get that. Let's consider this problem because it's the, the system that I will be talking about from now on. This is a 4F. So you have nine electrons in, in the seven 4F uh, orbitals. And the key thing here is to realize that the 4F orbitals are uh, practically shielded from the environment because they have different atomic uh, cells that are completely filled and protect them. So you can think of the 4F orbitals as buried into the atom and they don't feel anything that's going on out there. And that means that the, the total angular momentum is unquenched. So you don't have a splitting of, this or a splitting of the orbitals as you would have, for instance, in uh, D metals, where you have it's octahedral, you have the T to G A G and distance. Here from the onset, you have uh, the degeneracy of these orbitals. And that means uh, if you run the numbers here, you have a total angular momentum of five. And then the Russell Sanders coupling scheme tells you that uh, these are the different terms that you might have. And the question is, how do, how do they distribute? And it's very handy, very helpful to think about this in terms of, let's consider that your atom completely isolated, doesn't interact with absolutely anything. So not even with its own electrons. So you have four F or uh, electrons, uh, sorry, nine electrons in the seven 
orbitals. And then the next state that you would have would be a promotion from one of those F electrons, the D, but that's very high energy. Then you turn on the Coulomb interaction. You let the electrons to, uh, see each other. And then Hun's rule tells you that the high spin is going to be the ground state. Fine. Then you let the spin orbit interaction occur. And then that's where you get all these different things here. So from five halves down to 15 halves. And then if you introduce this, this atom that was completely independent from the world, you put it in a chemical environment like the one I showed you in the very first slide. Oh, sorry, getting my head on myself. This uh, term here, which is composed of six, uh, 16 states, is further split. And the key thing to realize here is that depending on what ligands you use, you can affect how these uh, levels are split and composed. And that's where chemistry can be useful because it, can, it allows you to systematically change the kind of ligands that you uh, incorporate. Uh, and uh, this is, it's, it's been a lot of research done in this uh, field. And basically the, the conclusions or the, the field has converged to a knowledge that is actual ligands are good. You want actual ligands. And the reason for that is very nicely exemplified by this uh, plot where I'm showing the angular dependence of the different free ion charge density plots of the different MJ states, in this case for this process. Um, right. So if you, if you notice, this one here, which is the least magnetic one, is kind of squished. And this one here, which is the most magnetic one, is kind of, sorry, elongated squished. I always get that wrong. So, Depending on, as I was saying, depending on what uh, crystal field you use, this you will be able to affect which ones are stabilized with respect to the ones that are destabilized, and that gives you an information of the energy total energy difference between the the, the different MJ states, and that gives you uh, information on one of the key parameters of single molecule magnets, which is the effective and uh, effective barrier to reversal of the magnetization. So you want this value to be large. So your molecule can retain its magnetization as, as, uh, as long as possible. And yes, and we've done some work. Uh, I, I was involved in some work uh, back in Manchester where the group of Dave Mills basically synthesized within these two uh, molecular environments, which can be thought of as axial and rhombic. They synthesized the whole lanthanide series and we compared the properties. And the conclusion of that work was that it actually works very well. We have these electrostatic criteria work very well. But the point is, uh, can we go further? Can we do something else? Uh, so what we did was to collect the best examples in the literature in terms of uh, performing single molecule magnets, uh, which are uh, this six, this prosium based, uh, sorry, cyclopentadienyl, which is this ligand here, uh, based single molecule magnets. And we looked at how the relaxation profiles, so remember the temperature dependence of the relaxation rates, so the inverse of the time, um, and see how they, they compare. And these are experimental values. And one thing that you can clearly notice is that they have fairly re re similar uh, chemical environments the dispersion atoms, but they have widely different dynamic properties. So there is clearly something going on here, which is uh, basically a spin phonon coupling. And the, so how did the spin degrees of freedom interact with the vibrational modes? And what we did next is, can we try to predict this to gain some sort of knowledge in, with, in what uh, is affecting these differences? So that's where uh, I'll be talking about our approach to describing computationally uh, from, from ab initio method uh, spin dynamics. First, you need to optimize the geometry. No mystery here, I've already talked about that. And then how do you calculate the spin phonon coupling? I've already presented the concept of uh, uh, crystal field Hamiltonian, but then what you want to do is to know how these crystal field parameters change with respect to the distortion, which is exactly the, the vibrational motion is what what this what it's doing is moving things. So you do a Taylor Taylor expansion of, of this, and then you cut 
uh, up to the first uh, linear term. And then you can plug this in, in what is now a spin phonon Hamiltonian, which is just same crystal field Hamiltonian, but containing the dependence on the crystal fields with the distortion of this specific mode J. And what we do is we take the DFT geometries, we take the DFT vibrational modes, we apply each of the vibrational modes, and then we sample along the distortion a number of steps. And at each step, we calculate the, the electronic structure with CASF methods. And then we fit that curve, and then we take the linear term, and that's it. Right, so we have the vibrational coupling. And then what do we do with that? We need to calculate the transition rates, which is telling you what's the population transfer between each of these uh, 16 states. And that's just briefly, it's a, it's a result from time-dependent perturbation theory. It's Fermi the golden rule, no mystery here, is the product of uh, the spin funnel coupling term, which tells you, is the vibration that I'm considering changing the surrounding or the, the environment of the dysprosium? Then the spin, uh, sorry, the phonon occupation number, which is, uh, is this mode relevant? And then uh, this term here, which is a Gaussian smoothening of your of the energies uh, between the electronic states, because since we are considering gas phase molecule, uh, a gas phase approach, we have a discrete discrete set of um, of normal modes, and if we didn't allow for some sort of distribution, this would become a direct a direct uh, a delta function, sorry, and then you would get zero everywhere. So, so it's some sort of artificial thing that you need to do, but it's only the important thing is to know that it's the only free parameter in our approach. And then uh, with this, you calculate the dynamics using the master matrix approach, which is basically telling mm -hmm. you what's the, what's the change in population of each of these different states. I here is each of these electronic states. Um, what's the change of population with time? It's just everything that goes into that state this minus everything that goes out of that state. And then you can do this at different temperatures and, and you can directly compare with the expert. And this is the result that we get. Basically, you have results that are full with half maximum independent, which is good because the only free parameter in our approach that we, importantly, we are off, yeah, by a factor of 10, more or less, consistently, but importantly, we get that molecule one is the slow, the fastest relaxing one, and molecule six is the uh, slowest relaxing one, which is consistent with uh, what was found experimentally, and that allowed us to say that our method is, uh, can be used as a predictive tool, and that's what we did. We looked at, let me guide you through this. Uh, we looked at different systems that aimed at changing uh, or affecting the key parameter of the uh, effective barrier, which is basically how far the distances are, uh, the, the ligands are, uh, the angle between them, and the charge of the ligands. And this is a measure of a slide, but let me just say, this is the black line, is the relaxation profile for molecule six, which is the best. Uh, so whatever lies beneath that black line, are systems where there is room for improvement. And the key conclusion of that work is that actually the static design of single molecule magnets in terms of maximizing the effective barrier has been somehow reached because you cannot keep, there's a limit to how much you can split the, the, your electronic states. And that one should now instead focus on trying to tune how the the vibration and the electronic states uh, interact. That's much easier said than done, but that's that. Right, so now uh, let me change uh, gears and we are here. And now we're gonna move to the second uh, family of molecules that I've uh, been studying uh, in the past years, which are organic radicals. Here, the thing to notice or to note is that you don't have any metal. So the design criteria that you need to apply to stabilize ampered electrons in organic molecules are completely different. And the way to try and think about them uh, is very nicely exemplified by topological arguments that were put forward many, many decades ago. 
uh, which are better exemplified in the, in the in the class of molecules of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And let me guide you uh, through that quickly. Here I'm showing you two examples of uh, alternant um, molecules. And an alternant molecule is just a molecule in which you can uh, divide or generate two subsets of starred and non-starred atoms. And they will be alternant if each of the star atoms are surrounded by non uh, star atoms, as easy as that. Uh, and you might be thinking, why is he telling me this? It's just nonsense. It's just, well, it's actually a beautiful result from topology, which is the number. So for even systems, the, the difference between star and non star is zero. And for odd, in this particular case, uh, is different from zero. And that different from zero value is a first indication of how many unpaired electrons you might expect to have in your system. So uh, it's a way of getting complicated uh, information through a very simple method. And to give a bit more body to that uh, reasoning, uh, one can actually look at the molecular orbitals for the uh, even and other alternate mm -hmm. hydrocarbons. And the key thing to notice here is that these are the the orbitals where the unpaired electrons would be. If you have an even system, you will always be able to perform a sum and subtraction of the two orbitals and localize the orbitals in, two, in, in the two different subsets of your classification. Whereas in the case of odd alternant, you can't do that. There is, there's always going to be a common region in which both orbitals are uh, defined. And why is that important? Because the energy difference between the different spin states is proportional to the exchange integral, which is nothing but an integral in space between different orbitals. So if you have something that is uh, defined in the same uh, region of space, that value is going to be large. But importantly, because uh, your system is alternant, no matter if it's odd or even, the <clears throat> orbital overlap between these orbitals is going to be zero because they are these are going to be degenerate and orthogonal. <clears throat> so you have a way of penalizing the need of a molecule to pair electrons and form a bond. You can think about this in terms of the orbital overlap with uh, while maximizing the the Hund's rule, basically putting the electron, um, unpaired electron, and uh, promoting ferromagnetism. And if you are a chemist and you want to think about these things in terms of valence bond, that's the resonant forms of this kind of things. And you can think of, for instance, how many bonds you will need to break for uh, to access the kinoidal. Um, uh, the kinoidal forms. So it would be zero for for the even and one for the odd. And that means that in order to get out from that system in which you have a, a triplet state, you will need to pay a lot of energy. Then the system doesn't do that and it remains in there. That's sort of a way of looking at it. And of course, these are just very simple uh, rule of thumb uh, approaches or, or ideas. Uh, but, and molecules are much trickier in reality. Uh, and I haven't talked about uh, aesthetic or delocalization effects for radical stabilization or the, the role of uh, solvents in stabilizing radicals. But nevertheless, this set of rules are useful. And that's exemplified, for instance, by this work that we did uh, some time now, in which the experimentalists Experimentalists in Barcelona, Jaume Vesiana's group, synthesized this, and then people in Delft uh, were measuring the inelastic electron tunnel in spectroscopy of this system, and they found something very weird, which is, depending on what sample they looked at, they had different ground states. So they contacted us and said, can you maybe rationalize what's going on? Uh, so what we did is, OK, we know how to calculate exchange couplings. Uh, exchange coupling is what gives you the energy difference between the spin states. And that's exactly what they are seeing in reverse in their experimental samples. So maybe we can say something useful. Uh, so what we did is 
as I said before, the broken symmetry approach, and consider that maybe when the molecule sits on the transistor, uh, there is some sort of distortion. And then we define an effective reaction coordinate as a, a concomitant, concomitant change of the dihedral angle for the three things. And what we found is that, yes, at relatively low energetic cost, you have a change uh, of the ground state. And that, so you go from ferromagnetic to anti ferromagnetic And interestingly enough, if you look at the spin densities of the system at this, this, and that point, what you can see is that you are disrupting the spin density in the connecting central ring. And if you want to think about this in terms of a concept that I've just introduced, you are going from a non-disjoint to a disjoint uh, picture. So ferro, anti -ferro. And that's what we, they see, and that's what we predict. And now, in the last five minutes, I'll briefly talk about this other work that I think exemplifies nicely uh, the potential of, mole of uh, organic radicals. Um, so already in the 90s, people uh, before that, they realized that these kind of systems were very promising building blocks for low dimensionality magnetism. And in the 90s, uh, Raitza in Nebraska started trying to synthesize these things. But crucially, what he did in his synthesis is he imposed planarity by covalently linking different units. And he did this because he thought, well, if we have a planar system, the localization is going to be much larger, and that's going to introduce thermodynamic stabilization, and that's, that's what we want. But they didn't get anything out of it. So when we looked at it, we thought, OK, we know these molecules have a lot of structural flexibility. Is there a way we can? maybe get uh, take advantage of that. So what we did is look at different uh, conformers of these uh, kind of things, allowing for structural relaxation, and compare uh, the, st the structure and the associated magnetic properties of the different conformers. And what we found is actually, there is a very beautiful helical structure, uh, which when you compare it to the linear uh, case, happens to be stabilized uh, around 3 kcal per mole per center. And because that's just basically because you have a lot of interaction between the pi pi system. And the, uh, because of that interaction and because that larger uh, delocalization and overlap, the exchange interaction between the spin centers is huge and much larger than the one in, in, the, in the linear case and ferro, ferromagnetic. And I think that this is a nice system that combines uh, ferromagnetic, uh, ferromagnetism and uh, chirality. And now we can allow ourselves the luxury of speculation. And let's say, OK, let's assume that this is uh, synthetically feasible, which I doubt it. But for the sake of argument, let's say. Uh, and let's say that the structural, the anisotropy that is given by the helicity induces a, some sort of spin orbit coupling uh, which results in an isotropy, the magnetic anisotropy. And then further, let's assume that you can synthetically separate the different enantiomers and that you can functionalize. Easy to ask. When, if you have such a system, what one could think of is uh, as a spin filter. If you were able to have the different enantiomers perfectly sitting in electrodes, you, would, you can think of passing a current uh, and maybe hope that the out, the current that you get out, uh, is spin polarized. This is an idea that I, uh, I had uh, some years ago, and I never really managed to take it any further because I have no idea how to perform this calculation. So this slide here is just maybe a shout out to help. Um, and with this, I think I'm running out of time. Very briefly, I'll say what's next. Um, my Basque uh, project relies on this idea. The lessons learned in polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons tell us that you can stabilize open cell states through the recovery of the, magnet, uh, of the aromaticity and playing with the connectivity. And the idea now is, can we introduce further elements that using these ones uh, allow you to also stabilize uh, the radical states? And that's, that's what I'm at right now. And 
Last but not least, I'd like to thank uh, all the people that have uh, helped me throughout my path. Special mention to Nicholas Children. He's been a fantastic mentor. Uh, I can only say good things about him. His uh, group is growing and he's doing fascinating things. Uh, John Krasgo, who was a PhD student when I was there and now is a postdoc in Bath, a fantastic scientist as well. And Gemma, I have only good words about all these people. And then uh, the synthetic group of Dave Mills in Manchester, who were actually the people doing all these beautiful molecules. Uh, without them, I wouldn't have been able to present anything. And then people in the University of Barcelona, my PhD supervisors and a collaborator that uh, had many interesting discussions throughout the years. And then, of course, here uh, at the University of the Basque Country, uh, Jesus Ugalde, big uh, thanks to him because uh, he um, uh, hosted me for my Iker Basque position. And also, uh, I would like to thank all the environment of the Química de Oricoa group. And then Luis Lezama in Leyoa, who is uh, an expert in EPR and uh, with who I spent a lot of time trying to characterize these bioradicals that I've showed you before. And with that, I'd also like to thank you. And that's me. Thank you very much, uh, Danny, for this uh, fascinating work. And we have now time for questions from the audience and also from uh, the people online who hopefully will be able to hear. And uh, you can either uh, shout out your questions or type them in the chat. Uh, we will be uh, asking them to Danny uh, as they come. So uh, questions from the audience? make a little bit of a technical question, but I'm also working with response properties. In my case, let's say perturbation is the electric field, not the magnetic field. But sometimes when I'm doing CASA CF calculations, I find that actually I over-localize the structures and that affects the nonlinear optical response actually, which is, um, let's say, lower than it should be even compared to much simpler mm -hmm. methods like heart rate. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if that happens also when you do, let's say, your magnetization calculations. No. Because two reasons. We don't include field when we are calculating uh, the CASCF that comes later when we extract the crystal field parameters. Then we can build our model spin Hamiltonian with the crystal field parameter, crystal field Hamiltonian and the Seaman term, which is what affects those. But in the CASCF, in the electronic structure stage, we don't include them. And also, I don't think it would matter because we are lucky enough that these systems are very well behaved. The, the spin orbit coupled ones, the, the dispersion ones. Really, it doesn't really matter what you th throw at them. They will give you a reasonable answer. Now, having said that, that's not the case with the diradicals or the organic radicals. There's a huge dependence on simple properties like single triple cap, which is not even response properties, mm -hmm. uh, depending on obviously your active space, but also of the functional that you use. So uh, yes and no, depends on what system you look at. The effect I mentioned is there even if there is no real, let's say you not, do not apply an external perturbation, but it's enhanced when you apply external perturbation. So, but no, maybe it's not there for you. I'm no, lucky. no, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm lucky. Yeah, I, I have a question about oh, whether Yes. Oh, yeah. sorry. Please. Yeah, no, I, it, it, it's okay. Um, I'm on the experimental side. So I understand that most of your calculation here just made for single molecule in gas phase. Mm -hmm. And then you're comparing with the result of experiments like the one in there, and their surprise comes. So most of the case, uh, when you are really experimentally trying to uh, construct a device or just putting them in contact with electrodes, then physics is completely different mm -hmm. because you have charge transfer, because your molecule deforms, because of many things, or simply because they are packing instead of being single. Yes. So how do you consider which actually is the, uh, the suggestion to uh, preserve the property of the molecule? And I'm afraid to disappoint you here because the conclusion of this work is 
there is no reliability. So? Uh, try other things. <laughs> no, try other, try to work with molecules that don't have so much uh, structural flex flexibility. Uh, okay, just simply taking the double decker tree is always a change. Ah, uh, yeah, but that molecule, the, the results of that molecule are taken at 2.2 Kelvin or millikelvin. And what I'm saying is that for Wolfgang and Mario Ruben and all these people to get these results, they had to to map, I'm pretty sure, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of surfaces is already different. Sorry? Put them on a surface and it's already a different world. Yeah, for sure. So answering your question, how do you address this? My only answer here would be, well, cannot change much. The, the effect of a charge transfer that you've mentioned cannot be affecting much the spin properties because you get a pretty bang on splitting of the states with fields, which are practically linear and can be reproduced very well. And this is just considered a spin Hamilton, um, uh, yeah, uh, Heisenberg Hamiltonian. So if you had other effects that took you out of this kind of linearity, they would be there and did not. Maybe in this case is because the fact that you have, everything is happening in the Pi system is very well isolated from the Fermi level of these uh, electrodes. And then you can treat it as a perturbation, a minor perturbation. But I would just refer to this. Hope that answered that. Yeah, yeah. But if you want to construct something, if you want to apply something, then this is a wide open world. Yeah, of course. I'm not claiming otherwise. So I think you showed a slide where the uh, you have this dihedral angle dependence of the ground state spin. I think yes. it's just one or two after this one. Um, yeah. So at um, I think you went through very fast. At a small small angle, is the spin ground state triplet or singlet? Yes. So basically, this lighter gray region. You have all the spins up. That's the uh, high spin state, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then once you cross, uh, given a value of the collective angle, one of the spins. Okay. And the explanation for that is, can you? Yes, please. <clears throat> because you end up with a system in which you've tor you've rotated, you've broken broken so much the conjugation of your system that. This spin density here has no effective way of communicating with other spins. And then it's just some sort of the way these are going to interact, if it's not through bond, it's going to be through space. That's yes. a bipolar interaction that's generally anti ferromagnetic. And okay. so the, the conjugation through the central ring helps with the uh, with getting the uh, high spin state. Well, it's fundamental. Is this? Is this? Okay. And yeah, if I say, if I may, I think most of the arguments in developing this uh, nano uh, graphene nanofragments and all these things stem from these kind of uh, ideas. But have you looked at uh, just turn one of the dihedral larger and keep the other two relatively flat? I, I think I did try that. Uh, I think you had to go to much larger rotations to see the effect, and even such large that uh, so large that you would have steric uh, clashing between the groups because these are <coughs> uh, these are per chlorinated systems, so they are very big. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of online questions uh, from our colleague uh, David Casanova. I will just read them out loud. Uh, first, how problematic is the mapping of ab initial energies to spin effective Hamiltonians in organic conjugated systems where unpaired electrons can be rather delocalized? Maybe, yeah, that's a mouthful. So maybe you'd like to answer that. Yes, and then, uh, no problem. Uh, we, have a pro we have a paper in which we build effective 
uh, Hamiltonian. I don't have it here. Uh, basically, you compare the numerical values that you get from doing a CAS three and three, in this case, uh, to the matrix elements that you would get if you work out the algebra of the matrix elements. That's, that's the idea of effective uh, Hamiltonian theory. So you can uh, do a one-to-one -one correspondence and uh, you get a reasonable answer. And the second one is, can non-Markovian effects be important in the spin dynamics of uh, SNM? Which effects? Uh, Non-Markovian effects in the spin dynamics. Yes, but before going there, I'd say that we are missing many more, much more important things. Uh, so we, let me see. <clears throat> for the expression of uh, the transition rates, uh, this is just for the Orbach process. I don't know if you've noticed, but I cheated you here because in the experimental results, I'm showing the whole temperature range. And then when I'm showing you what we obtain, I'm showing you only high temperature range. There's a reason for that. It's because <coughs> there's a reason for that, which is that this <coughs> part here arises from two phonon processes, which are, uh, and then even further down in temperature is quantum tunneling of magnetization. Uh, my work, what I was involved in, uh, we could only reproduce this uh, high temperature term in which you only have a one phonon process. But I have to say that Chilton's group have now come up uh, with a way of not even having to distort the molecule, you just calculate the electronic structure uh, uh, at the ground state, and then you calculate, you get all the, the spin phonon couplings without having to distort. Uh, and then they can also incorporate the two phonon processes and they reproduce all the profile. Uh, so answering the question before going to think about these uh, normal non-Markovian things, uh, I'd say uh, that was that was a first issue. And then the second issue is uh, we are considering uh, gas phase normal modes, which is not the case. It is not reality because these things are in crystals, and you need to calculate uh, to consider the the phonon, uh, the acoustic phonons in the low energy region. And then even there is another layer which would be an harmonicity, which is you are calculating the phonons in a harmonic approximation, which might not necessarily be the case. And then I think the non-Markovian Markovian uh, effects would come after that. So I'd say, judging from how well now Chilton's group is able to reproduce experimental values, I'd say that no. OK, so we should probably conclude here. Uh, remember, you can ask more questions uh, to Danny uh, with like our refreshments. Uh, uh, he's staying with us for a little while. Uh, but before that, let's thank uh, our speaker again. And thank you very much.